here is me working an Eku or Iku Kata. Eku boat or traditional weapon from Okinawa. Okinawa is an island chain, lots of boats, lots of fishermen. So it makes sense that in a place that was fairly obsessed with systematizing martial arts skills using a variety of objects, that this would be one of those. What makes the Okinawan tradition stand apart, if not alone, in terms of using an oar or a paddle as a weapon, is that they didn't end up with a purpose-built weapon inspired by the oar. Pretty much actually kept it to the board oar. Now, I've made one video on this weapon before, seen here, but I want to really focus on the unique application and use. Now, I don't just mean fighting, because obviously that's not unique for a weapon. What I mean is the way you hold and swing it, as you saw in that kata, but we'll get into those details. First, though, you know, there's a much broader tradition of fighting with, again, things inspired by a boat oar. So, Pacific Islander warrior clubs of various sorts are paddle-shaped, like this one here from Fiji. And there's countless other examples. Now, it's a chicken and the egg scenario. We cannot say for sure that Pacific Islanders were using paddles to, you know, paddle around, right, in their canoes, and then came up with weapons based on that shape. But it seems like a pretty good bet. So here's a great example of a purpose-built weapon in that shape, right? Hawaiian famous shark tooth war club. And in terms of shape, it really does look like a canoe paddle head that was just chopped off, right? All the examples I've shown so far are one-handed, but there are two-handed paddle weapons from this part of the world, as seen here. And I think with this kind of thing, the link to an actual oar is more discernible. I know it's a low-resolution picture, but nothing I can do about that, and it was really hard to find an example of a two-handed one like this. And the difference between that and this is, that last one, it's a purpose-built weapon you probably wouldn't wield it like you would an oar, but this one here, it still literally is an oar. And this is what I'm fascinated by in at least some of the katas, like this one that I do here. Uh, you do an actual rowing a boat, propelling it along the water motion. It's kind of the mainstay of the kata. And that to me is pretty darn unique worldwide. And this instrument here has been used worldwide as a weapon, even in a non-systematized martial arts context. It only took me a little bit of googling to find a recent news story where someone used an oar in a fight. And just see the picture on the right that was attached to that news story from 2019. Yeah, the woman standing in the water is wielding her oar against that man. Who deserved it, by the way, because he rammed her boat with his and she had kids in there. So here's another one, right? Probably not a good idea to go after a gun-wielding uh, police officer with your oar. And then the man in our next story caused, quote, serious bodily injury, end quote, when he used one. Yeah, so a little bit of an underreported thing in terms of weapons history. People have been fighting with these for as long as they've existed, which goes, you know, well into prehistory. You're standing in knee-deep water, getting out of your boat, somebody attacks you, whatever. You're holding your paddle, your oar in your hands. What are you going to do? Well, of course you're going to use it. You're looking at a rendering of Captain James Cook, one of the most famous explorers of all time, and uh, he had a man, one of his sailors, used one. Basically, he was having a disagreement with a local chief about a canoe, and the chief grabbed the officer that was trying to take the boat. Quote, the chief seized him, pinioned his arm behind him, and held him by the hair of his head, on which one of the sailors struck with an oar. The chief instantly quitted the officer, means let him go, snatched the oar out of the man's hand, and snapped it in two across his knee. Oh, wow, so that was a tough chief. Uh, yeah, these were tough people, the likes of which ended up killing Captain Cook, <laughs> as uh, depicted here. And yes, I know I've mentioned this next one before, but you kind of pretty much obligatory to mention that probably the most famous samurai duel in history was won by Miyamoto Musashi wielding an oar, one that he had kind of carved it down. But I can say I never showed you that last image or this one here. And I think there's little doubt, though, that what Musashi did in wielding that was he wielded it like a naginata, you know, a halberd, a glaive in European terms. What's interesting about the Okinawan tradition is, like I keep going back to, fighting with it as if you were holding it so that you would really be rowing a boat. But of course you do hold it in different ways. So here's a pretty normal weapons grip that our master is employing. But in contrast, while standing in the water, look at this grip, right? The weapon is held up high with the quote-unquote blade up above, and notice the top hand, it's reversed. And that is a very atypical grip, 
but it's perfectly typical if you're actually going to use this to paddle through water. So we have a fighting style and techniques that are based on the muscle memory people would have already had from using this item in the normal peaceful way. And that's why it's pretty neat that out at my sensei's land, we were actually doing rowing as part of our workout and working out on sand, on the water. Ooh, taking a break here from an Eku seminar. Eku was a fisherman's boat oar used as a weapon and we're doing actual boating to test out the techniques. It's interesting when you do it, you realize why you grab this thing in such odd compared to typical weapons forms ways, whether it's European, Japanese, you name it. The way that you hold and use this thing in the kata and in the fighting techniques seems really odd. Well, it doesn't seem that odd once you actually get out here. It's gonna look a little weird, but it's the best I can do because I'm by myself. So, it seems like a very solid hypothesis that the fighting grips and style are based on using your innate muscle movement from years of fishing. You've got all those synapses built, all those pathways connected. Why wouldn't you use those motions and those muscles when devising a way to fight with this thing? So, Sensei's got us using his boats out here. We're on the Hambu, the farm slash dojo. And I would say this is a very practical and fun and unusual weapons fighting Kobudo martial arts experiment. There we go. I'm doing the exact same motion that I do every time in the kata. And it'd be real hard to find an analogous motion with a glaive or a halberd or something like that. Whether it be a Asian or Occidental, you know, Naginata, whatever. So proof is in the pudding. I think this theory is sound. Been working out all day and now I'm rowing, I'm tired. There are the guys. And I was tired too. Like I've been working out for hours and then I'm out on the boat, but got a thrill doing that. There's some of my fellow students, two man boat. Some guys working out on the water, some guys still working out on land. It was a really neat thing. And now let's jump over to contemporary Okinawa to watch people paddling. And we'll see that the oar, which is not shaped like a western one right it's very straight and long but you notice it is definitely still in use over there and the motion the backwards motion this guy is employing here i'm sure he's someone who doesn't know what kobudo or kabudo is and doesn't care it's the exact same motion i'm doing here with my left hand and so dipping your oar into the water the start of the rowing motion becomes a ready stance and as the blade moves backwards i move forward exactly like when you're in a boat so notice my feet there, right? As the oar goes back, I step forward. Here you can see kind of the before and after. And I just think this is wonderfully weird and I think until now completely unremarked upon, unobserved. And it's really interesting to think about, like, was this on, done on purpose? I kind of doubt it. Did they say, hey, Nakata, let's make sure you kind of propel yourself forward through the air the way that you do on the water when we're in the boat? Well, no. My guess is it really was just that intuitive of a process. But then, interestingly enough, you know, that counterintuitive motion, it doesn't make sense, you have to paddle through air to move forward, was used in an effective fighting manner. See here. Dipping the oar is striking downward with the blade, which then leads to a thrust. So here I go, moving forward straight into that overhead strike. The rowing loads the weapon, if you will, and while closing the distance. And you step and strike simultaneously right there, and then you set and deliver a power shot. And because, as seen here, you hold it in the rowing position, look at my left hand, how it's reversed, you're engaging your back muscles as you strike down, which is exactly what you do when you're, well, you know what, rowing a boat. Now, let's look at some HEMA, historical European martial arts type images, to try to see how unusual or not this arrangement is. Two guys here swinging, both holding in what I would call the most intuitive grip, which is not a reverse grip, right? See both of them holding it the same way, really. It's how you would naturally swing an ax. And why people normally swing a long weapon in this same way. So here's a modern image, some HEMA practitioners. And if you look closely, at first it might look like somebody's using an unusual grip, but no, they are also both doing kind of, you know, the axe or sledgehammer type swing, the most intuitive one. But that doesn't mean that you can't find 
the Iku grip anywhere outside of Okinawa. No, you definitely can. So take a look at this. Both men are holding their staves in the Iku-like way. In fact, imagine a paddle-like shape at the end of these two weapons, and it really looks like they are doing what I was doing, like they're about to row. I know I've used that verb a lot in this video, uh, the blade backwards. But I do not think you would actually find them using a technique quite like that. They'd keep the weapons in front of them, as you see here. Here's a mix and match. Man on the left is in more of a natural grip, but our guy on the right, and this was not easy to find, is holding his weapon exactly like I was with mine. Notice the blade is up and behind him, and he's got the haft in, I guess you could say, a double reverse grip. Pretty unusual, though, like I said. I mean, go watch as many HEMA sparring videos as you want and see how many times you see somebody holding a weapon like he is on the right. Probably won't even see it once. And anyway, this is some of the most fun I've had training in Kabuto in quite a while. Just getting out there, yeah, you felt like you were in Okinawa. We weren't. We were in North Texas, but we felt like we were. And it really helped crystallize my thoughts on this weapon and why it feels so unusual when I practice with it. I'm like, well, you know, I don't do this with a bow, and Kabuto has umpteen bow katas. I don't do this with other staff weapons. Like, what's going on? So anyway, one last bit of fun is that little tiny island. I was the only one who insisted on rowing out there and then trying to do the kata on it because uh, I thought that would really feel cool. Uh, the funny thing is, it was so muddy. But again, part of connecting to the actual historical roots of this thing, I couldn't take good footage because I was by myself. But anyway, that's it for this. Uh, Iku is a really fascinating weapon. There's a lot more to say about it and show, but I wanted to focus on that one aspect in this video, an aspect that I don't think anyone else has ever touched on. So that's it for now. Here's me headed home under a very hot Texas sun after many, many hours of working out in a nice, thick, heavyweight gi. Uh, hope you found that interesting. Thanks.